So the first thing you need to know is that the first time you ever do anything matters enormously. Because after you've done it that first time, it's never the first time again. So think about going off to college or going off to high school and it's the first day of class. And you show up for that first day of class and all kinds of things are different than they ever were. For example, it's the first time you're staring at a particular room in a particular building. It's the first time if you're going off to college that you've had to do something like get from point A in a residence hall or in a, an apartment somewhere through the buses into this room here. As you stand out in front staring around at people, you'll realize that this is the first time you're ever seeing them and that they're ever seeing you. You walk in and there's a professor in the front of the room and that's the first time that you've ever seen her or him. It's all firsts. The thing about this is what you can do on that very first day of anything, if done right, will be setting the seeds for you being successful from then on. But if you don't do it on that first day, it's not going to work. Here's one simple example. You show up on that first day and you sit down next to someone. I guarantee you they don't know you. You don't know them. They don't know anybody else either. You can choose to look over at that person and say, hi, I'm Fahid. Or you can sit there silently. In which case, the person sitting on the other side is going to turn and say, hi, I'm Angela. And suddenly they're friends and you have no friend. Isn't that amazing? And then the next time you show up, you look and you realize that, that Angela's talking to this person and is like, huh, stuck up. <laughs> what is it about them? How come I can't be their friend? And it all goes back to the fact that they turned and looked at each other and said, hey, on that first day. I'm, I have a son named Sam. Sam is an extraordinary goalkeeper. You know why he's a great goalkeeper? He's never nervous about anything. Nothing ever ruffles his feathers. He's the kind of guy who, now that he's in high school, occasionally we have him ride the, ride the bus, I will say, all right, Sam, at 7.43, the bus is going to show up. We're not taking you to school today, so be there at 7.43. Sam thinks it's all good. It's all going to be fine. How many times have we had to go home to get Sam and take him to school because he showed up at 7.44 and then blamed the bus for being what, on time? This happens a lot, where you develop this kind of confidence in who you are, and some of you out there actually know that this is who you are. So you're sitting in a dining hall, it's morning, and uh, your class is at 9.25, and you are utterly confident that you know that you can get there. I was just talking to an individual who wanted to know where Burdine was here on this campus. It's like, oh my gosh, it'll take me like 27 minutes to explain to her where Burdine is, because this is a big campus. And I'm taking through all these steps. I must have talked for seven minutes to her. And, that and I know where Burdine is. Imagine if you're talking to somebody who doesn't know where Burdine is, and they give you directions to the state capitol or something. This happens all the time. And it all happens because you develop this kind of sense that it's all going to be fine. It's all going to be good. No. That nervousness inside you that comes on that first day and in that first week and in that first year, let it overwhelm you. It creates that kind of jitteriness that makes you think to yourself, all right, I've got to be on edge. I've got to make sure that I do everything right, from catching the bus on time, to being in my seat on time, to having my textbook on time, to being ready to form that study group and to study and to take that test. Nervousness, initially, is a great, great thing. When you see people around you who aren't being nervous, you should weep for them, because that overconfidence is going to catch up with them. I never got to know anybody my freshman year. Here's the thing about why it is that you want to get to know your classmates. You might think, oh, it's about the social adeptness that comes from getting to know that person you're talking to. That's not the real reason. The real reason you want to get to know your classmates, aside from feeling comfortable, is that they are your connection to this kind of layer of what the classroom knowledge is. So you have a professor, you have a teacher who stands in front of you and talks and the words go out there. If you're lucky, you catch maybe a third of them, because there's a lot of stuff being talked at you. But for the class as a whole, it's capturing it all. And it's filtering it, and it's sorting it, and it's figuring out what's important and what's not. 
And then it becomes part of this classroom ethos. Everybody knows if they're a part of the class. But if you're not part of the class, then when people are saying, oh, did you hear what Professor Richardson said? He said we don't have to do problem number two. You just spent two and a half hours working on problem number two. This happens all the time. Successful students are the students who are aware of the knowledge of the class. And the only way you can be aware of the knowledge that the class has if you're part of the class. And how do you become part of the class? Because on that first day, you turn and you look at that person next to you and you say, hey, I'm Fahid. And then the next thing you know, you're in a study group. And the next thing you know, you're finding out what's on that coming test instead of being back home in your room not knowing about it. So like, I was the worst college freshman ever. Loner is, in fact, very much what described me. And a lot of this had to do with the fact that I simply didn't feel like I belonged. And now most people feel that. Some people are, are pretty comfortable, but especially when you go to a new place. If you come to UT Austin and you're from a small town, you're going to feel overwhelmed to be in a big town. If you come from a school where most people study the humanities, but you've decided to become a science major, oh, suddenly you're an outsider. If you live off campus and most people you know live on campus, then suddenly you feel like you don't belong. Over and over again, there's that constant result, that fact that those connections don't happen. When that happens, you find yourself in an amazingly bad place. And in that bad place that you find yourself, you start to believe that, that somehow you aren't part of what's supposed to be going on. My first year in college, I felt I didn't belong. By my fourth year, I loved that place. Well, why wasn't I loving that place as a freshman? I wasn't loving that place as a freshman because, for example, when it was time to go to the dining hall, I raced in there to be the first one in, found an empty seat, ate as fast as I could, and raced home. Whew. Avoided social interaction. I have to tell this funny story. Um, and this is a true funny story. It is my um, responsibility to show up, eat lunch. I'm looking for an empty table, and I find it. I'm sitting there. And then suddenly I realize it's the table that the SAEs are sitting at. It was a fraternity. I was at their table. Oh, my gosh. I had never felt so embarrassed in my life. Suddenly there's like 20 guys surrounding me. They're all gigantic, and they're wearing SAE outfits and hats. And I'm like this down more and more and more. Now, because I was shrinking down more and more and more, I had this contact lens. This contact lens is feeling this kind of scrunching of my eye until suddenly, pop! This contact lens pops out of my eye and down into my food. So I'm confronted by an opportunity to develop connection with the SAEs. And I could have asked, can somebody help me find my contact? Or I could eat my contact. <laughs> so I ate my contact and got up and raced back to my dorm. I don't know why you're laughing. It's kind of sad. I, I ate my contact. This all came because on that very first day, I didn't turn and look at the SAE next to me and say, hey, my name's Fahid. Many people are loners. They feel like they're disconnected, like they don't belong. And that is what causes that incredibly painful initial alienation wherever they go. Your first day in high school, all you kids from Dobie Middle School. Your first day in a summer program because somebody took care to let you do some research at a campus somewhere. Your first day in college, your first day on a job. Fighting that, overcoming that, it's the most important thing you can do to be successful. You see that guy? He's wearing a bow tie. Isn't that weird? Bow ties. I bet you're sitting back in the audience your first day looking at your teacher or looking at your professor and thinking things. You're thinking things like, uh, genius. Oh my gosh, this person's so smart. They're so intimidating. They're so, oh my gosh, I couldn't ever possibly talk to them. They're thinking, um, well, let's see, I'm a guy, I got a bunch of kids, I come to work, I give a talk on a subject I know, I go home, I drive my kids to soccer and basketball practice, 
cook dinner, take the garbage out, watch some TV, go to sleep, get up the next morning, come in and stare at a bunch of kids who think that I'm something out of this world. I'm not. I'm a guy. That's all I am. Actually, I'm something more than that. I'm a guy who has decided to spend his life showing up and standing in front of classrooms and giving talks to people that I want to know about chemistry. So if I'm willing to do that, that's what's got to be in your brain. Not that I'm intimidating, but that I'm somebody who wants to help you become a success. So at that point, we ask, who is the real problem here? When students talk about how professors aren't approachable, when students talk about how professors are intimidating, that is just hogwash. That's just a cop-out for the same reason that you didn't decide to say hello to the person sitting next to you. Walk down to the front of the classroom, look up at that person and say, hi, my name's Melinda, and I'd like to say hello. I'm looking forward to being in your class. Or if there's actually somebody talking about something really interesting in class and you think, wow, that is like neat. Do you know what it's like for me when a, when a student shows up in my office and wants to talk about chemistry? I mean, I almost fall out of the chair in glee that somebody loves the subject that I love. This idea that there's this divide between you and the faculty member, I will say this, I said this forever, it's 90% on the student. If you can get over that barrier and realize that we are the replacement moms and dads, the replacement mentors for you in your life, that's when it is that college is going to become great. So I have to tell this story here. And the story is actually a pretty good one. I bump into people all the time who, when they hear this kind of angst-ridden bit about who I was, say, that story saved my life. I never knew that I was as pathetic as someone else, but you were more pathetic than me. All right, so, so it is my freshman year. I spend the entire freshman year in um, um, a um, dormitory room, never going out and talking to folks. I wasn't a big partier. I wasn't going to join a fraternity. Um, I hadn't been raised to like be social in this way. It's just what I was. In other words, I was a science major. So, um, <laughs> so as a result of that, for the longest time, I just didn't feel like I had that connection. And then I met this girl who was in a dormitory, a, a girl's dorm, and she invited me over, and this is so embarrassing, but it's true, to play spoons with her and her friends. Spoons is this kind of card game where you put a bunch of spoons out, and it's actually pretty fun, and you deal out the cards, and then somehow somebody ends up grabbing a spoon, and then everybody else tries to grab a spoon. It's kind of like musical chairs, but with spoons. This is what I did my sophomore year of college. I played spoons in a girl's residence hall, and I made friends there. I mean, they were friends with the kind of girls that play spoons in residence halls in the evening, but it was my kind of person. And it was out of that that I ended up developing my first friends, and it was out of that I got my first girlfriend ever. It was actually pretty neat. If somebody had told me as I started college, David, the pathway to your happiness will be accepting an invitation to play spoons in a girl's residence hall, I would have been deeply saddened, but Actually, in hindsight, I realized that that opportunity made all the difference in terms of my ultimate happiness in college. This one's really important. When you walk in and sit and listen to a subject, and I'm talking to you, Dobie Middle School, and it's boring, a boring government class, a boring math class, a boring biology class, the only reason it is boring is because you don't understand. What I've come to realize as I've gotten older is that once I understand a subject, I find it to be incredibly neat. And we're all like that. But how do you get from not really wanting to listen because it seems hard and it seems boring to the place where you're actually hanging on every word because, oh, you know what? That's actually really interesting. Here's a perfect example. My second girlfriend ever cross-stitched. I don't know if you know what cross-stitching is, but it's this kind of thing where you like have a needle and thread and, and like you, you sew stuff and then you make these designs, these pictures out of it. When I met her, she cross-stitched and my only thought was, that is like the most boring thing I've ever seen in my life. And then one day I thought to myself, well, she sure seems to be enjoying it. There must be something there. I'm gonna take a chance. 
I'm going to start cross-stitching. <laughs> and I did, and I cross-stitched, and I made this thing. It was a, I played basketball, and she was a gymnast. So I made this sort of like cross-stitching of me shooting a shot and her being on a balance beam, and I gave it to her and told her I loved her. It was great, but I had a ball. I spent hours and hours for days cross-stitching. It was like one of the most pleasurable things I did in my 23rd year of life. But if somebody had told me earlier that year that the greatest pleasure I would have as a 23-year-old was going to be cross-stitching, I would have thought, no, that's pathetic. You're seeing a theme here, I think. Um, some of it is how pathetic I am, but some of it is the fact that if you open yourself to the idea that you really don't know what it is that you're going to love, and that includes medieval Renaissance history, it includes quantum mechanics, it includes all those boring subjects in middle school and high school. Open your ears, work hard, listen, get over that barrier, and the next thing you know, you're gonna love it. This is why students change their major so much in college. It's because they've actually matured enough to the point where they will listen to a professor teaching them mythology and go, hey, that's kind of like that, that, that stuff from that comic book. Yeah, I think I'm going to change my major to mythology major, and I'm going to go home and tell my parents I'm not going to be an engineer. It's great. <laughs> I had this epiphany. Um, you have to understand, first of all, that um, studying ahead of time didn't work for me because I am by nature a procrastinator. So um, when I was supposed to be studying, I would be drinking coffee, throwing a Frisbee, sleeping on a couch in the Union. There are some, out as you walk out, boy, there's some great places to fall asleep here <laughs> in the Student Union. Um, cold day, like 20 minutes to Burdine. There's that fire, there's a fire, there's a couch. You have no idea what it feels like. All right, so I have decided to cut through the back of the library. And there's a young woman sitting at a carol in the library studying. And it turns out that it's the um, roommate of my first girlfriend. And I said, uh, Catherine, what are you doing here? She said, I'm studying. I said, oh, you got a test? She said, no, I just finished class and I'm reviewing my notes from class. What? <laughs> that's, that's just ridiculous. Why? She said, well, because I want to do well. I don't want to cram. I don't want to stay up all night. I don't want to be under constant pressure that I'm not going to succeed. And I said, well, how's this working for you? Because this place is hard. And she says, oh, no, this place is easy. I get A's in all my classes. As a matter of fact, I'm a partier. Did you know that I enjoy the heck out of my life? that because I have the discipline to study at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning in a carol, on Wednesday night, when you're cramming all night, I'm at that fraternity party having a good time because I know the next morning that I'm going to be able to ace that test. I meet people like this every once in a while. I'm now married to somebody like this. I was watching when she was in her PhD program. It's like she would be like studying quantum mechanics or something. And then she'd put her book away and say, hey, you want to go to a movie? I said, but don't you have to stay up all night and cram for a quantum mechanics test? And she thought I was out of my mind. Why? I already know this stuff. For some of you, you're going, yeah, that's who I am as a student. For some of you, you're thinking, I don't believe them. I don't believe there are people like this. But actually, there are. And part of the maturation process is that ability to develop that discipline so that you can do these things the way you need to. And as a result, you have the time to really enjoy college. Which leads to this basic notion about routines. Everybody has these things that they typically do. They go to bed at night. They eat their lunches and breakfasts. They groom themselves. And then you have to lay the routine for college over the top of it. For most people, routine in college simply means I need to go to class and that is all. Except that if learning in college was simply me talking at a student, then every student would always get an A, right? Because I will say out loud what is on the test, you will hear it, you will then take the test and get the A. But we know that's not true. You walk in and you think, I'm not understanding them, or that was pretty funny, but I don't get what that's related to. And then you're through with class, 
and you are going to fail the test unless you start to do something about it. I talked about the idea that the worst way to do it is to cram all night. The better way to do it is to look at all the structures that are put into place to be successful. I teach a freshman chemistry course, and in this freshman chemistry course, I provide Monday through Thursday night academic communities in the libraries and the residence halls. I also provide another 20 office hours that either I or my TAs make available to the students. Can you imagine saying, even though I don't have to, Tuesdays at 9 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to go to Burdine Hall and ask questions of my TA. And then Thursday after class, even though I don't have to, every Thursday I'm going to show up there and I'm going to talk to Dr. Lottie because that's when he has his office hours. When you build this kind of rhythm, this kind of routine into your life, this is the way you're successful. If you want to know who I know are the students who get A's in my classes, they're the students that, like clockwork, show up at office hours every week, whether they need to be there or not. It's within that routine that the real success for you in college comes. This is that obligatory place where we describe failure and how important that is. I think I started off by letting you know that I majored in failure. I majored in failure when it came to going to medical school, didn't get in. I majored in failure in my freshman chemistry course. My freshman chemistry, did I mention I'm a chemistry professor? Do you know what grade I got in my freshman chemistry course? A C, one of the lowest grades in the class. That was me. I then went on, get this, to flunk out of graduate school. That was a real winner. I remember calling my mom and saying, Mom, it's so great. Over the last 18 months, I've failed to get into medical school, and I've flunked out of graduate school. Yes. <laughs> and here I am, 25 students earned PhDs in chemistry with me, and um, like I'm a professor teaching the subject I got a C in. How did I get here from there? And this is where I tell you what you're always supposed to say to people. Nobody ever gets from here to there without failing a lot. Because on the other side of failing a lot, if you have whatever it takes in you to get up the next morning and get it done, whatever that is, then you're going to be successful. Instead, if you decide to get up the next morning and say, that's proof that I don't belong, then you'll never make it. There's this Aesop's fable um, about the fox and the grapes. People don't read Aesop's fables anymore, but this is actually a pretty good one. Uh, there's a fox and... I don't know if it's a he or she, is just sort of walking along and they see some grapes and they jump for the grapes and they don't get them and then they just keep on walking and say, ah, they were probably sour anyway. Having that kind of attitude about the goals, the aspirations you have for yourself is a terrible one. It's an easy way to walk away from the possibilities that you'll become something that you really want to be. That C, my freshman year of college, in a subject I now teach and love, could have been my way of saying, see, I knew this wasn't right for me, but evidently it turned out not to be the case. I encourage all of you to go find somebody older than you and sit and look at them in the car on the way home. When you get home, especially if you've got like grandparents, they failed a lot because they're like old. And just look at them and say, tell me about the failures in your life and what happened on the other side of them. And if you respect them at all, then you will find out that the reason they are the kind of person you respect is because of the stories you, they tell you about how they overcame that adversity. We live in a world that believes that you're supposed to win the lottery every time you buy a lottery ticket. But that's not how it works. What happens is that we get from here to there on the other side of failure in little small bites. This will especially be the case for those of you going off to college where you are trying to figure out how to become the best student, the best studier, the best person walking across the stage at graduation. The answer to that is it will be incremental. It will happen a little bit at a time. A perfect example of this is the grades you will earn in a course that you don't do well, or the grades that you will earn in a major where you start off not so well. I got a C in my freshman chemistry course, I got B minuses in my organic chemistry course in my sophomore year. I got B pluses in my physical chemistry courses my junior year, and I kicked butt 
in analytical chemistry my senior year. I could have stopped anywhere along the line and said, what was the point? I, I never like won the lottery. Or I could realize that if the grind happens, if I just keep going and going and going and going, I'm going to get what I want. I have a graduate student um, who was a TA for me. He wanted to go to medical school. And the first time he applied, they turned him down. And the second time they applied, they turned him down. And the third and the fourth and the fifth, I kid you not, he applied six times. They should have taken him the first time. They should have. He was a great guy, really smart person. Things just didn't quite work out the way he wanted them to. And he could have walked away. I knew a young woman who spent her first two years in college on 6th Street. Way too much partying. And get this, she had a 0 0.6 GPA after two years being dismissed and coming back. She wanted to be a doctor. In her third year, when she got it right, she got her 4.0. Her fourth year, 4.0. Her fifth year, 4.0. When it was all over, she had a 3.17246 GPA. And she was in my office. Oh, you have no idea how hard I have to work and work and work just to nudge that up a bit. It wasn't until her sixth year, four consecutive years of a 4.0 to erase the two years of partying on 6th Street. But she did it. Remember her calling me on the phone and telling me she'd gotten into medical school, and I said, thank goodness, I was so tired of writing you letters. <laughs> Isn't that great? Isn't that great that this person persevered in this way? Not expecting that it was going to be a win the next day, but expecting that over the long haul, she was going to get what she wanted. I want to talk a little bit about internal and external gratification. I can't tell you how many people define their successes in this world on the basis of what the person sitting next to them is doing. So on that first day of class, when you look over and see Abigail, and you say, hey, Abigail, nice to meet you, recognize that Abigail is probably a pretty great person, but she is not the measure of your success. Sadly, though, this is what students do. They look at the people around them taking tests and say, that person's smarter than me. I guess I don't belong. Or they'll listen to a group of people talking, lying about their grades on tests. That almost always happens. They think, oh, I can't believe it. I am so much worse than that. Isn't that awful to think that your life is being defined by people you cannot control and external evaluations that you can have nothing to do with? Because what's the point? You didn't get to make the choice on it. I mean, think about this. Do you know how it is you get into medical school as an example? Somebody has a gigantic stack of manila folders. And they're reading them one by one. And right about the time they get to yours, they decide they need to get a cup of coffee. And they come back, and they put yours up there, and they don't read it. Ah, ah, you can't control that. That's the way the world works. The world is random. The world is chaotic. And to blame it is not a good idea. Instead, look inside yourself. Love yourself. I remember once when I was getting married, there was a priest who was like doing this pre-cana thing. Um, and he said, I'm going to tell you the secret, ultimately, to your success in life. This is how you lead a happy life. He says, every morning, I get out of bed, I walk in the bathroom, I splash water on my face, and I look in the mirror and say, I love the heck out of you. <laughs> oh, this is so true. This is so true. That internal love, that internal compassion for yourself in terms of your failures and ultimately your successes is what's going to drive you ultimately. When I meet happy people, really truly happy, they're happy because they love themselves. When I meet people who are unhappy, it's because yesterday they like themselves because somebody said they had a nice purse and today they don't like themselves because somebody told them it's not. My big, big wish for you is that as you think about all of these things that I've talked about here, you realize that ultimately what matters most, and I know this is kind of hard to understand as an eighth grader or an 11th grader or a 12th grader, is that life is a long haul. And in the end, there's only one person you're going to be able to count on, and that is you with the gifts you have inside you, knowing that if you honor them, if you value them, if you just drive and grind after them, that ultimately you're going to end up being a very happy and contented person. And I don't care whether that's the high school experience you have, you middle schoolers, 
or the college experience you folks in senior year of college, of high school are having, or those of you adults sitting in the room who are probably, a lot of you, just nodding at me. Yeah, that's, that's the case. When you leave here today, if you're a young person with an old person, turn and have that honest conversation with them because that is that process of growing into an adult. Okay. Thank you.